Welcome. We're glad you're here. I am Mark Wilson, director of the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and Humanities, affectionately known as Pebble Hill, and known as Pebble Hill because we maintain the historic Scott Yarbrough House. And you're going to hear a really important story today about one of the persons who grew up in this house, Byron Yarbrough. And to deliver that story today is a really important person. I'm going to do a very short introduction because I want you to have as much time to hear from him as possible. Dennis Blocker is, works at a hospital. He's an EMS technician. Um, but more than that, he's a person who is faithful to his parents, as you will find out uh, through this story. And he's faithful also to the cause of history. He's a historian. The level of research that he has done that has resu resulted in this book that's only been out a month, published by uh, an outstanding national publication house, written by a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Mitch Weiss. Um, but really, Dennis is the one who made this story possible today. Today we had a great day in Montgomery at the Alabama Department of Archives and History where he spoke, and we're very honored to have you here. We're also honored to have Dennis's father with us, Dennis Blocker Sr., and his mother, Debbie Blocker, and some other important special guests, some of whom I'm not going to tell you about because you'll hear about them in the presentation in a moment, um, but then we'll have a special recognition after the program as well. So please give a warm Auburn University welcome to Dennis Blocker. Can y'all uh, hear me okay? It's coming through all right. Thank you. Make sure this is on. It's an honor to be here. It's uh, a long journey to here. <laughs> when I first started, it was just a genealogy project for my mom, and uh, I had no idea that where it would lead today. Um, it's surreal to be here, um, the Yarbrough home. And you'll find out why here in a minute. Um, but thanks, I want to thank Mark for uh, having me here and uh, all the hospitality I've been shown since being here and uh, members of the Yarbrough family and uh, the Jones family. Let's get started. I want to tell you about my journey. These are my grandparents. My mom's parents, Clifford Lemke and Eleanor Boyd Lemke. Uh, they both grew up in Wisconsin, uh, Clifford up in northern Wisconsin, which is logging country. They are German immigrants, and uh, his father uh, was. And uh, Eleanor grew up in southern Wisconsin, and uh, her father was a farmer. Um, what drew them together was an ad in a newspaper uh, for Park Falls, the uh, wise Park Falls Herald. And uh, my grandfather saw an ad for a ammunition plant that was uh, going to be opening up in Baraboo, where my grandma was. And uh, he's 17. He tried to join, but Grandpa, uh, his his dad, Fred, wouldn't let him join uh, because he had been in World War One. He had served in the ambulance corps, and he had seen what happens when you go to war. And he would not sign for his son to go, so he had to wait till he's 18. In the meantime, he went down to Baraboo, took a job as a uh, truck driver, where he drew the where he would uh, drive the finished product, the powder that would be used in M1 cartridge rifles and also the powder that would be used in rockets. Um, he would drive that to the train station. The powder was being made by my grandmother. He was mixing it and they would, that's where they met. They met at the ammunition plant there. When he went to war, he joined the Navy in 1943 and was sent to the Pacific. Um, he went, was aboard an LCI 449, LCI, which we're going to find out, stood for Landing Craft Infantry. Now, growing up as a kid, I knew that my grandfather had served in the war. I saw his, these pictures, uh, so I knew he was a sailor. But that was it. He didn't talk about it, as most uh, veterans who have seen uh, combat and the death of their buddies uh, won't. But in 1998, my grandmother, who was very important to us, uh, passed away with leukemia. Shortly thereafter, my grandfather began to speak very darkly and uh, had a lot of dark thoughts, and the family hid his handgun from him, afraid he might do something with it. 
and he went into a rage and demanded his handgun back. And uh, on August 11th, 1999, he woke up in the morning, took his wedding band off, put it on the table, took his wallet out, took his ID card out, stuck it on top of the wallet, put it in a Ziploc, took his watch off, set it beside the wallet in the Ziploc, wrote out a note. He called 911. When the operator came on and said, 911, state your emergency, they just heard a pop. And then, of course, there was an open line from that point on. And uh, EMS PD arrived and uh, pronounced my grandfather deceased. Two years later, near the anniversary of his death, my dad called me and says, Dennis, can you please come over to the house? Mom's having a hard time. I went over to the house. My mom was crying at the kitchen table. And I was massaging her shoulders. And she turned around to me and she said, Dennis, I want you to find out what happened to Daddy during the war. I never expected to hear that. And I, I said, uh, why? why you know, what's... She said, I have to know why he couldn't sit through a World War II documentary without crying. I have to know why he couldn't even sleep with Grandma. Why, why he would have to sleep in a separate room. She told how that when she grew up as a kid from his room, she would hear screams in the middle of the night and yelling, shrieks. And then she would inquire about it, and Grandma would just hush her. She says, I have to know what, what was going on, what he went through during the war. And I'm going to show you a picture now of my mom with my daughter, Lauren. Lauren's always got to get in the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so I said I would start on the journey. But where to start? I mean, this is 2001. There's no uh, high-speed internet. <laughs> it's that famous <laughs> sound. And, uh, of course, we didn't know any better back then. But where to start? Fortunately, I had my grandpa, when I was younger, autograph a World War II book that I had. He autographed it, Seaman First Class, Cliff Lemke, LCI 449, 43 to 45. So that set me on my course. I knew I needed to find out, all right, what LCI 449. I knew enough about the military to figure it. LCI probably stood for Landing Craft Infantry, and, uh, which it does. But I thought it was uh, this one, <laughs> and that is not an LCI. I, I figured it was the landing craft infantry that comes down. You see Saving Private Ryan, the, Marine, uh, the soldiers all come running out on Normandy Beach. That's what I thought an LCI was, but it's not. That's an LCVP. So I want to introduce you to the LCI. The LCI was uh, 150 feet long, 20 feet wide, and they had ramps that came down on each side of the bow. And the soldiers would uh, debark on each side of the bow, would carry over 200 soldiers, 200 troops. So if you can imagine hitting a beach with you know, 10 or a dozen of these at one time, you have immediately deposited a bat battalion of guys on an enemy beach. Now while these troops are landing, you can see that there is uh, armament up here. They have the 20 millimeters here, 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 and then they have two in the back. So they have five 20 millimeters that are all got interlocking fire, and they're just laying down this barrage against the enemy positions. This is an overhead view of the LCI. You can see the gun positions here, 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 and here. This is the bridge. And then this gives you a kind of a good view also of the ramps as they're on the side there. This is an LCI gunboat as they're heading into a beach in the Philippines. They're firing off their rocket barrages. A lot of the landing craft infantry had been converted into gunboats. Now this is Normandy uh, invasion. The LCI is heading into the beaches at Normandy. They're mass convoys. Another view of, you can see the rocket uh, pods here on an LCI gunboat. This is one of my favorite pictures. You see all of the, uh, the dark LCIs here. And then you can see the little white, everybody see those little white streaks? Those are marine-laden uh, uh, LCV, uh, not LCVPs, um, LVTs with the Amtrak tanks and the Amtrak vehicles that are passing by the gunboats. The idea was is that they learned from, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here, 
But the idea was is that while the Marines are heading in, see you got your battleships back here and your cruisers, and while they're laying down fire, there's a point in time when the, they have to lift their fire because they're afraid of hitting their own troops. So during that time, they found that Americans hitting the beaches were susceptible because the Japanese inevitably would emerge from their bunkers, reman their positions, and then just start destroying the enemy. So they said, well, why don't we get rid of these during that time where that during that time of period where the Japanese are coming out of their bunkers, what if we have these LCIs come in here and we put rocket launchers on them? And while their Japanese are emerging out of their bunkers, the LCIs all of a sudden are just hitting the beach with just barrages of rockets. So why the need for gunboats? Tarawa. How many of who's heard of Tarawa? So those are the Marines on the beach at Betio Island. Uh, it, was, it was a lot worse than even this picture. But the, they had faulty intel that they would get into the beach and there would be enough water over the uh, reef and that they would be able to bring in their landing vehicles. And when they actually made the invasion, they hit up against the reef and the Marines had to wade in water up to their chest, hundreds of yards, which is incredibly slows you down. And they just got mowed down by the hundreds. And they realized then that they were going to have to do something about that. And so they developed two things, a, ta a tandem team. They got need for the UDTs, which today we call the Navy SEALs. And they got the LCI gunboats to go in and give them cover fire. And they thought, well, what better vehicle than to protect them than a gunboat and an LCI that can get right up to the beach anyway. And we just put a bunch of 40 millimeters on it and rocket launchers. And we'll get them all the way into the beach. So they went from being a landing vehicle to a gunboat. Now each rocket, you can see the rockets here with the fins, each rocket was the equivalent of a five inch shell, which is the main armament of a destroyer back then. So if you can imagine having ten gunboats side by side, each of them firing off hundreds of five inch rockets, all hitting the beach at the same time, that's some devastating firepower which was coveted by the Marines. Meanwhile, in Auburn, Alabama. Here we have Byron Yarbrough and his brother Clark eating sugar cane right here on this property. There's Byron again with Clark. By the time war came around, Byron, <coughs> see, Byron knew that his father, Cecil, who was a doctor, he had served in World War I as, an, as a Navy uh, doctor. And he had heard his dad's stories. And when war came, it was an easy jump from Byron for, to, to go into the military and uh, to join up. And he did. You see Byron Yarbrough. This is the original crew of the LCI 449. <coughs> Now when Byron joined up, most likely he had uh, these thoughts of joining and being on a, a fabulous aircraft carrier or being on a battleship or cruiser, something glorious. But he was given an LCI 449 flat-bottomed cork that crossed the ocean on its own power. And it must not have been a very uh, a, a great day for him when he realized he was going to be on the uh, LCI 449. As you can see, this is from the gun deck looking forward. There's no luxury. The, the laundry is hanging out. Um, they had no refrigeration. They had no ice cream. They had no movie nights. It's a picture of the conning tower. 40 millimeter guns here. It's a picture of the 449 behind the LCI-80. That was in Guam. There's Byron on the conning tower of the gunboat. Next to Rufus Herring, Leo Bedell and Fred Cooper. Ensign Cooper, to this day, is still listed as missing in action. Ensign Leo Bedell, after you read the book, will probably agree he should receive the Medal of Honor. And Rufus Herring did receive the Medal of Honor. Iwo Jima's first. And Byron Yarbrough did not come home. The missions that Byron, by the time that Byron is, is, is in the uh, 
heading towards Iwo Jima. He's already been to Kwajalein. He's been in, a ba in the battles in the Lesser Marshals. The, the campaign in the Lesser Marshals is really in interesting read. They were, had, now they were in charge of the Marshall Islands. They had taken Kwajalein and Iwitak. So now you're in charge of all these islands, which are hundreds, by the way. So now you have to govern. You have all these people you're responsible for. So, well, they all had little Japanese radio stations scattered all throughout the Pacific. And these reports are coming in from the native population that, hey, we're, we're being harassed, you know, can you help us out? So the 449 gunboat with Byron aboard, and um, they would have a company of Marines that would go with them, and they would go to these, visit these little islands, and they would have these little battles with these small Japanese outposts, and they swept through the marshals cleaning out all of these um, outposts. Saipan. Saipan was particularly terrible for, uh, for Byron and his shipmates because uh, it was at Saipan where they were, as the Marines were pushing north, there was nowhere for the civilian population to go. It was the first island where the, they had been where there was an actual Japanese civilian population in mass. So as the Marines are pushing north, the Japanese army is dispersing information to all the people that the J Mar Marines, to be a Marine, you have to have been in prison, and which a lot of the Navy guys would agree, you have to have been a cannibal and you know all, all this hor you know horrific stuff and so the, the civilian population they don't know any better they can't pull out their iPhone and Google can Marines really they there's there's they have to believe it so when the Marines are pushing north they're terrified and as they go more north the the, the, the land is diminishing and they're pushed into a corner and they have no po uh, other option and <coughs> With, with the LCI gunboat 449 floating off the coast there at Saipan, the Japanese mothers and fathers start tossing their children off of the cliffs. And then the mothers would jump, and then the fathers would jump. And if they hesitated, a Japanese officer would throw in a hand grenade into the family and then push them over. And then the next family would advance, kill themselves, blow themselves up with the grenade. Then the next family would push those family, mem family members off. And it was just this continuous destruction, death, the scene. Now what you don't think about is that when this is happening, it's gruesome to see, but it gets worse. Because now, the, now after days, the bodies are decomposed, they start to rise up off the bottom of the ocean. Now you're laying in your bunk at night, you're a guy on an LCI 449 gunboat who's been assigned to patrol along the beaches, and alongside your head as you're sleeping there, you can hear the body thumping against the hull of your ship and then you get up in the morning and you walk outside and you just see you know children and babies and moms and dads and all these families floating around your ship and now you're watching as hordes of flies come off of Saipan and they start landing on these bodies feasting and then they come on your ship and they land in your food as you're trying to eat and they're landing on your food and they're trying to so it's this macabre scene of, of just this descent into madness where it, things are just getting worse and worse and they're thinking you have to put yourself in their shoes they know they're advancing to Japan. If, if they're fighting this hard now, like, what are we in for? We're never going to get home. And that's the mindset of Byron Yarbrough, I'm, I'm never going to see home again. They go to Guam where they, they really undertake underwater demolition teams, recon missions, and then they go to Tinian for that invasion as well. And then they, they begin, uh, if anybody has ever seen that, movie with Henry Fonda and Jack London, Mr. Roberts, uh, where that crew is in the backwaters of the war, the war has passed them on by, and they're sitting in the marshals, just staring at what they say in the, that stinking island over there, and that's kind of what happens to the 449 crew. Here they've been the tip of the spear this whole time, and now they're seemingly left behind, and as the, the advance goes on to the Peleliu and other parts of the Philippines, and now they're stuck at Saipan, staring at that stinking island, ferrying troops um, back and forth from uh, Saipan to Tinian. And they are um, they're escorting this Japanese fishing vessel, which is you know, gathering up fish for the civilian population. They still have to feed them. Um, transporting troops. There's swimming parties. They are, um, it's mundane. They're baking in the sun. There's nothing going on. They're seemingly left by themselves. They're ferrying people around, doing mail runs. I work in the emergency room for 17 years. And I've seen people die of every kind of way you can imagine. 
of every age you can imagine. And I can tell you that over time, every time you, see, you witness something, it takes, you have a guard on your heart. I like to say you have like a guard on your heart that your parents put on you from birth and they protect you from a lot of things. But when you're there in that situation, you're seeing, it's like somebody takes a little ball peen hammer and a chisel and they just, a little clink, and a little chip comes off of that guard on your heart. After so long and seeing so many people die in such needless ways from uh, children, abuse, neglect, starving to death, drunken drivers, wiping out whole families, um, uh, somebody who came up short on drug money and was tortured for three days, like all of this stuff that you see, put that in Byron Yarbrough's heart, in his mind. Here he's seen all of this death and destruction. And here on the ship, he's the executive officer. So as the executive officer on the gunboat, he's got to censor the mail. And one of the things, that he, censoring mail, he's reading all the letters from all the guys they're sending home, talking to their loved ones, talking to their wives, talking to their, uh, their families, their girlfriends, their fiancés, and they're talking about the future, and I love you, and this and that. And here he is, this lonely guy who doesn't have a girlfriend, <laughs> and he's got nobody writing him other than his mom and dad and uh, some family from home. And... Um, He's lonely. And on top of that, he has all these haunted visions of all, these, all this death and destruction around him. It was very dark days for Byron. September, August, September, October, November 1944 were terrible, terrible, dark, dark days for Byron Yarbrough. And then came Betty Jones. Betty Jones was minding the family store back in Cordial, Georgia. Um, her cousin, Mary Ballinger, was in college, and her room best friend in college was Jane Yarbrough, who was Byron's sister. And they were talking one day about, you know, whatever, different things. And they, <laughs> he says, you know, my brother is really lonely out there in the Pacific. You should read this letter. She's like, man, he needs to write somebody. And they were like, I got my cousin back home who is miserable back home because her mom won't let her go and join the military. She wanted to be a nurse. Why don't they write? So well, let's try it out. So they go and they approach Benny Jones, and they're like, hey, we have an address of this young officer who's out in the Pacific. His name is Byron Yarbrough. Um, you want to write him? He's lonely. She's like, all right, I'll write him. So she starts writing him. November 2nd, 1944. Byron answers a letter he got. He says, Dear Betty, I've started this letter three times so far, and each time I wasn't satisfied with what I said. So here goes again. What I want to say is this, I was very much impressed by your nice letter and I wish that I could begin to impress you as much in turn. It is very sweet of you to write me and I will try my best to return the favor. You can see that it's kind of like your first date that you have with somebody. You avoid any topics that will like tick them off and they're like, yeah, that's the end of that date. So you don't talk about religion, you don't talk about politics, you don't, you talk about the weather, <laughs> you, you talk about your family, you talk about neutral subjects that are not, and that's exactly how this letter goes and, and the letters that follow. But what's interesting about these letters is that, and what was really interesting to the, um, the Yarbo family was that nobody knew they existed. See? Sir, how are we doing on time? All right, thanks, sir. When I started this research, one of the first places that I went to was the Alabama State Archive website. And I left a message on there about Byron Yarbrough. I said, I have, um, looking for anybody that knew him, I'm writing a book, or I'm not writing a book then. I was researching and trying to find anybody that knew him. And I forgot about it. Two years later, Nancy Dupree, <laughs> was uh, cleaning out the, her folks' attic 
at the house, and she came and she found a, a chest. She opened it up, there's some sweaters, this and that. And she gets to the bottom, and there's a stack of letters wrapped in what looked like to be maybe a, um, what would you call, what was it? Yeah, it was kind of, kind of a sash. Maybe it was like maybe at one time it had been around a bathrobe or something. And then they were wrapped around it. It was blue and looked like it was silk. And she picked it up. And they were from a Lieutenant Byron Yarbrough to Betty Jones. Really intrigued her because she had never heard of a Byron Yarbrough from her Aunt Betty, who she called D. She opened up the letters and she noticed that the last um, third of the letters were unopened. And they were all from her aunt to, to Byron. And they were all stamped return to sender. So she was really curious what that was all about. She got on the internet, put in Byron Yarbrough, enter. First thing comes up is my po my query about anybody know anything on the Alabama State Archives about Byron Yarbrough. So it was like too easy. It was like, goodness gracious. So we got in touch, and I told her what happened to him. The letters, they start out uh, just kind of friendly and, and, and just talking about uh, little easy subjects. But then over time, they start feeling a little bit more comfortable with each other. He talks about uh, his roommate who's from Akron, Ohio, Ensign Leo Bedell, uh, how he's always giving him a hard time about Midwest basketball and football teams are so much better than the SEC. And, and Auburn is like, and, and of course, Byron Yarbrough is a graduate from Auburn, so he's like throwing a fit. And uh, he reminds him about, you know, 1942, they had four bowl teams and blah, blah, blah. And he's giving them a hard time. They're going back and forth all in fun. And um, they talk a lot about sports and the letters to each other. But we notice one thing that as he's getting closer to Iwo Jima, he warns her. He says, something big is coming up. And I want to, to give you a heads up because there may be a time when you don't hear from me for a while. And um, so as he's, this time is coming closer, he's getting serious. He's getting more serious with her. And... January 14th, 1945, he writes her, Betty, I must say that I'm very much impressed with you, probably more than you seem to be with me, but I do think you can tell a great deal about a person by that person's letters, and it holds true. In censoring the cruise mail, I find out some things about their character that I probably wouldn't discover ordinarily. I wish you could know how much I'm wishing for that time when I can meet you in person, you know. I've never had a girl that I actually could actually share confidences with and show how I feel that they and that you are understanding enough to fill that place. That's how much you impress me, and I just threw letters too. My only hope is that you find me less attractive when we actually meet. Until we do meet, Betty, I'm going to express myself just as I feel, and I hope you will feel free to do the same. On January 19th, he writes, you know, it's not so bad out here as long as you're doing something, but the minute you become idle, you start thinking about how long you've been out here, or how much you'd like to be at home, or you get to thinking about somebody you would particularly like to see. That's when old brother despair comes in. On the January 20th, he writes, Your mother sounds like mine, Mary as we all call her. She married Daddy when I was six years old, and the first time we saw her, she, and she answered Mary, so Mary has been ever since. You will love her. I know, she is forever doing things for others, never thinking about herself. I wish you would go over with Mary Ballinger sometime and meet all the folks. There's plenty of room. I know they'd be glad to have you. They always speak of how lovely your big old house is, even when it's so empty. You say you're fond of bridge. I know the folks would ask you to play if you went over. When I was home, Daddy and Mary used to invite a very nice lady over, Mrs. Sparrow, and I used to play bridge with them. I would like for you to meet those people anyway. Auburn is just full of nice young people, and I'm sure Cordial is too. January 27th, 1945. In my prayers at night, I speak of you as my girl because I think you mean that much to me. I think that God knows what I'm talking about, too. Betty, my common sense tells me that I'm rushing our relation far too fast, but I just can't help but like and admire a person who has sacrificed as much of their time and thought as you have me. And believe me, I'm sincere in what I say. My sister thought that you were a match for me, or she never would have suggested any such relation. I can't help but wonder if you share any such feeling for me. But keep me wondering, will you? I feel perfectly at home writing to you now, and, and you can see. I just don't hesitate about expressing myself. I really don't think there is anything about myself that I wouldn't tell you if I saw you. Honestly, I would just spill it out all in a mad scramble of words. 
On February 4th, 1945, he writes, Now I'm going to present you with my problem. I'm writing to a very lovely girl from Cordial. We've been writing to each other for some time, and I have grown quite fond of her, and I hope she is fond of me. I'm afraid to tell you how much I really do like you. Honestly, you're in my every thought and in my conversation a great deal of the time. February 11, 1945, officers walked around the ship of LCI gunboat 449 and were proclaiming the news that it was the last mail call before heading out to Iwo Jima. All the sailors were to write their letters home if they wanted to write. Hence, right now at home in my research files, I have a lot of February 11, 1945 letters. His last letter to Betty. Betty, why don't you and I have an understanding? I've never had an understanding with a girl before, but I've heard and read about it, and I like the sound of it. Let's have it understood that you are my girl, and I'm your boy, guy, beau, man, or whatever it is. They really don't have a nice-sounding possessive for a man, do they? But when a guy speaks of my girl, that is something really nice. I'm your guy if you want me, and I want to be yours. As far as I'm concerned, that's the way I would like to have it, unless you have a better suggestion, which would probably be more sensible or nicer. So... You can tell your bridge club whatever you like now, and it will be so. Betty, nothing would make me happier than to meet you at the train when I come home. Your interpretation of my statement was just what I would have you know of. Of course, if you have any scruples about being there, then that is your affair. But nothing would suit me better than having you all there, all acquainted with my folks. I wish you would go over and visit sister and meet the folks, and then write me what you think of them. He's writing his letter. He's talking about meeting him in that house right there. He takes a pen in hand again and writes another letter, this time to his folks. Dear folks, I've spoken of Betty Jones a few times in my letters, but I think I had better tell you just how well things are going now. We've been writing to each other regularly since we started back in October. <laughs> I don't know why, but we seem to have a great deal in common, and our relation has developed rapidly. Indeed, it has developed so rapidly that I want to warn you about it before, <laughs> before anything embarrassing can happen. Our relation has developed to the extent I received a letter from her this week in which she states she's going to write me daily. For my part, I've asked her to be my girl, which might seem absurd, but she accepts it, and so do I. We both think it's strange that we should become fond of each other merely by writing each other, but each admits that it is so. I've asked Betty several times in my letters to go over and visit Sister and get acquainted with you folks, so don't be surprised if she turns up one day. I don't know if Sister knows well we are getting along, but please tell her. February 17, 1945, that is the LCIG 449 headed into the beach at Iwo Jima to support underwater demolition team recon at the beaches there two days before the invasion. Byron Yarbrough at this moment is right at the top of the tower right there, and that may be his helmet. You can just barely see. Iwo Jima from the air. These are the beaches that they were protecting the underwater demolition teams on. How are we doing on time? We're okay? The beaches were lined up thus. You see LCI 449 is assigned to Yellow Beach 2, and there were 500 yards between each gunboat. Each, <coughs> each colored beach was assigned to a different UDT uh, uh, platoon, and uh, they were to go in and check the beach for soil samples, look for obstacles, mines, anything that might blow up the Marines that were going to be landing in two days. The LCIG 449, now at this moment, Byron Yarbrough is right here. That's where he's standing. Next to him is Rufus G. Herring, the skipper, the signalman, and a couple observers. The first hit they took was on the bow. They got hit by a mortar. A lot of the gunboats were being hit by shells from artillery at Iwo Jima's uh, Mount Suribachi. The thing about artillery is it's kind of a flat trajectory. So the gun, gun, other gunboats were taking hits in their engine rooms and troop compartments, which were unoccupied relatively. Mortar round is different. It comes in from the top. And it hit right there where there were a ton of guys manning a 40 millimeter. A bunch of guys died right there. Then they took a second mortar, which hit right between the two 40 millimeters that were manned by a pointer, trainer, first loader, second loader, and several ammo passers. There's about 20 guys standing right there at that moment when that mortar round hit right between them.
and the third hit directly right into the conning tower where Byron was standing. The mortar round landed right beside him on the deck. On the day he died, Betty Jones wrote him, The news from the European front is really good and has been lately. Maybe that part will be over real soon. Then I hope those Japs, excuse me, that was the time of the are rough thoroughly taken care of and you can come home for good. Oh, what a happy day that will be. Sometimes I don't see how I can wait, but I make a reverse in mind and remind myself that I have to wait. Even if I don't want to, I think you know by now, Byron, that my one main thought is of you, what you are really like to be with, and all of your little habits. The following day, she writes, and how is my Navy lieutenant in the Pacific? I have come to the conclusion that if given my choice, I much prefer writing you each day than doing anything else. The time I spend each day writing you does so much for me. If I feel bad or if I'm in a bad humor and sit down for a chat with you, I feel like a new person when I'm through with my letter. Most of my letters don't say very much, but there really isn't much that ever happens here. But you say that makes you happy when you get a letter from me, and I guess that's why I enjoy writing you each day. I think I could write you almost anything, I'm thinking, because you seem to understand my thoughts, not even having seen me. Always remember, Byron, I'm thinking you be constantly and praying for your safety. Love, Betty. February 19th, the day the Marines are hitting the beaches, she writes, I like the idea of the understanding you'd like for us to have. See, she's gotten that letter now where they, he says, let's have that understanding. I like the idea of that understanding you'd like for us to have between each other. I'd love to be your girl, and nothing I could think of would be make me any happier than to be called Byron Yarbrough's girl. Suppose instead of my boy, guy, beau, or man, how about I call you my Byron? That's a woman's sensibility right there. The others have been used so much they are worn out. But my Byron, that's new and seems to be for the better to weigh in with my thinking. February 24th, 1945. I know that somewhere in the Pacific is a man, my man, who is the sweetest person I've ever known. Today I received a little package in the mail. It was postmarked Auburn, Alabama. But I know the thought behind it came from a certain Navy man somewhere in the Pacific. Honestly, Byron, these pearls are beautiful. They came this afternoon, and I really do love them. See, Byron had sent a letter to his folks. Remember that February 11th letter he wrote Betty and the one he wrote his folks? He asked them to send her something nice, so they went out here in Auburn and bought her some pearls and sent them to her. You're really too good to me. You have me a spoiled brat, the first thing you know of. I know one thing, though, as I said before, you're the sweetest person I can think of. I've never known anyone before who was as sweet to me as you are. I know that there isn't a luckier person in the world than your girl Betty. I could keep on raving, Byron, but for the rest of the night, but that might be too much. Always remember, I think of you constantly and praying for your safety. Hurry home as soon as Uncle Sam will possibly let you. These letters continue day after day after day. She writes him every single day. And it takes almost a month for her to be, for news to reach the Auburn, to reach that door. March 10th, 1945. She's still writing him. It's March 10th, almost a month. My dearest Byron, oh, glorious Saturday night. I can really relax and look forward to a wonderful day of relaxation tomorrow. Did I say relax? Excuse me, my error. The kids are in here now putting a show on for me. Honestly, how can anyone can have so much energy is beyond me. They make me tired just to watch them, and if I had to get up and do something like they are doing, I believe I'd have to die instead. Sometimes I wonder if I'm not getting old before my time. She then talks about a frame that she wants to get for a picture of Byron. Then she ends, Good night, my Byron. And always remember I send you my love, Betty. That's the last letter she wrote because she was notified the next day that Byron had died almost a month before. And then she had the added pain of every mail delivery day getting those letters back that she had sent coming back and every time it was a reminder to her. See, she had given her heart to somebody. She didn't think there was any, anybody like that for her. She took a chance. She never married and she died an alcoholic. She never got over that. This is just one of the stories that was uncovered all because my mom says, I want you to find out what happened to daddy during the war. Things that would never would have been put out had it not been for that simple request. I could tell you about 
so many others, Howard Schoenleben. I could tell you about Raphael Johnson, the only African-American on the ship of 70 sailors. Imagine being Raphael Johnson in 1943 to 1944. Here you are, an African-American sailor on a gunboat with 70 other sailors. Your commanding officers from North Carolina, your executive officers from Auburn, Alabama. That's a recipe for disaster, seemingly, but not on the 449. Raphael Johnson was promoted above others, made a gunner on the ship, excuse me, on a small gunboat like that. If you make somebody a gunner, you're putting the life of your crew and your ship in their hands because when Japanese dive bombers start coming down, the feared and vaunted and respected Japanese dive bombers, the ones that same that they attacked to Pearl Harbor and did such damage, when they're coming down on you, you want somebody with a steady hand and has proven himself in combat. That man is Raphael Johnson. I'm getting off trail again. I'm getting off now. But that's another one of the other people you'll read about. When I went up to Decatur, Texas and interviewed his family and got down with them. My grandfather, of course. All, all of this now in a book, all because my mom says, I want you to find out what happened to daddy during the war. And I want to encourage you, like, dig in to your family's history. What? Dig into your own family and see what are your World War II connections? What are your World War I, Vietnam? Who knows what's in your attic upstairs? Thank you.